We are in the middle of a series learning from the book Sharek Dusha, Gates of Holiness, written by Rabbi Chaim Vital. Today we're going to conclude gate number four, although even if you're not following the series, this will not uh, 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 this will not be a stumbling block that you don't understand because I don't follow the series. Of course, I highly recommend to follow the series. All the videos can be found on atsmood.com. One of the most powerful, inspiring, uh, important book that everybody needs to learn. Again, Sharik Dusha, Gates of Holiness. But in the last few classes, in the entire gate, in the fourth gate, we were talking about that every person has to do whatever they can in their power to fulfill all 613 mitzvot. And then we went through a, a series of classes covering the five types of mitzvot that I need to do. And we concluded it that the first group of mitzvot, then I ha it's all the mitzvot that have to do with praying in the morning during the week. Which for a man is to put filin, to put alit, to say kiyat shma, oh, no. a lot of mitzvot. Then another group was mitzvot that I can only do it if Hashem gives me the opportunity to do. And we explained some of them, just to remind you, one of them is to circumcise a child. How can I do a brit milah if I don't have a child? If Hashem gives me a child, then I can perform the mitzvah. And like that, there are many other mitzvot. But this group of mitzvot is when Hashem has to give me the opportunity. Another group of mitzvot was uh, the mitzvot that can only be done when it's concerning time. So we just celebrated Pesach a few weeks ago. You can only celebrate Pesach in Nisan. You can't celebrate Pesach in the summer. And it's only a mitzvah to eat matzah on Pesach. All year round, eat matzah, great. But it's not a mitzvah. Another group was mitzvot that Hashem has to give me access to do it. If Hashem doesn't give it to me, I can't do it. And for that, we also gave a long, a long explanation. And the last group is mitzvot that I have to look to do. I have to look to do them. I have to find a way to do this mitzvah. So now we're concluding, after we went through all these classes, that I have to do all 613 mitzvot, and that's how we started the gate, that a person has to put in their highest priority, how do I do all 613 mitzvot? Now comes the big question, how do I do that? How can I do all 613 mitzvot? I'm not a Kohen, a lot of the mitzvot are for Kohenim. We don't have Bet HaMikdash, a lot of the mitzvot, we need a Bet HaMikdash. So how can I really do practically? 613 mitzvot. I will never, ever, ever able to do 613 mitzvot. And let's say, assuming there's a Bet HaMikdash and I'm a coin, But there's mitzvot that has nothing to do with me. Some of the mitzvot are just for men. Some of the mitzvot are just for women. Some of the mitzvot are bound to a time that we have a king with a Bet HaMikdash. So really practically saying, no man has ever did 613 mitzvot. Not Moshe Rabbeinu, not David HaMelech, who was a king, and a lot of the mitzvot are dependent on a king, but he wasn't a Kohen. So how are we re uh, required to do 613 mitzvot? And we all know, oh yeah, I have to do 613 mitzvot. That before I even started, I can't do it. And more than that, I mean, we just concluded, the, concluding the gate, that I have to do all these 613 mitzvot. And if you listen to the classes, and if you didn't, I'll remind you, a lot of the mitzvot I will never be able to do. All sorts of mitzvot that, uh, I mean, I told you, one of the mitzvot is that, uh, that I, if I divorce my wife, is to remarry her. And I told you already that I have a friend that one time I called him, I told him, how are you? How's the kids? How's your wife? He's like, oh, we got divorced. <gasps> you got divorced? Why? What happened? He's like, no, I wanted to do the mitzvah of bringing back my wife. So I divorced her and I'm going to remarry her. You don't initiate something. You don't divorce your wife so you can later on marry her again. So we learned practically that a lot of the mitzvot you can't really do even if you really want to do it. Now comes another big question. Okay. A lot of the mitzvot uh, we can do with what's called b'pnimiyut. I'll explain. 
We just celebrated the uh, Lag Baomer. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai <laughs> lived in a cave for 13 years. How did he do the mitzvah of matzah? He had a matzah factory in the cave. How did he perform the mitzvah of the four species on the Arba Minim, on Sukkot? When he had a, a trees there with an etrog and a lulav and, and how and how, how did he do all these mitzvot? Okay, so the Zohar says he did it, bepnimiyot. He knew how to do the mystical effect of the mitzvah and it was like doing it with a physical object. I mean, there is one opinion that says that it was a miraculous, uh, uh, every time it was a miracle when things just came to him to the, to, the, to the cave. But we're going by the simple explanation. And the same way that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai would do mitzvot bepnimiyut in their spiritual level, Avraham Avinu did the exact same thing. We know that Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov fulfilled all the entire Torah before it was given. And they would do the same thing just without the physical object. Yaakov used to put sticks on his hand and put a string on it and do the exact same effect that we do with filin. Just he didn't do it with leather. So there is a way to perform the mitzvot in a spiritual way. Okay. Now on that will come a question. If I can do the mitzvah in a spiritual way, so why do I need to put filin on? I'll do it in a spiritual way. Same thing with Shabbat. I'll do it in a, I'll just sit like this and I'll meditate and do kavanot and I'll put filin on in my mind. And I know you're laughing, but there's some uh, clowns in our generation that that's what they say. You don't have to put filin on. You can do it in kavanot, in med Kabbalistic meditations. And people believe. So we have kind of a, a double-edged question. If I do it in a spiritual way, then why am I doing the mitzvah at all? I'll do everything in a spiritual. I'll sit on some mountain, like some fakir in India, and I'll do everything in my mind. But you can't do that. You have to practically do the mitzvah. So how can you tell me that I can do the mitzvot in, in, a, in a spiritual way? And on top of all that, how can I do all the mitzvot? Physically, it's not possible. So now we're left with this big question, so how am I required to do something that physically is not possible? Okay, so there's a very simple answer to this question. How do I do all the mitzvot? Our sages say, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh. We're all responsible for each other and we do one for the other, right? Now, can we accept this answer that Kol Yisrael Aravim Zebazeh, so the Kohanim have me in mind when they do their mitzvot and then I like as if I did it? Because after all, practically saying, we are all obligated to hear Kiddush on Shabbat. One person does Kiddush, he has the, everybody in mind and everybody's including in the Kiddush. You have to hear the blowing on the shofar on your Rosh Hashanah. Did you blow the shofar? No. There's one guy who blows the shofar. He says the blessing. He has in mind to include everybody in the mitzvah. You have in mind to be included in the mitzvah. And uh, voila, I heard the shofar. And we say, But I didn't blow the shofar. 500 people in the same synagogue. So one might say, yeah, one person can do the mitzvah and he includes in the mitzvah everybody else. So when our sages come and say, Kol Yisrael HaRivim Zebazeh, we're all responsible for each other. Yes, yeah, so the Kohen have to have in mind to include me. But is that sufficient? I didn't do the mitzvah. You know, now with Firat Omer, Halacha says, if I forgot to count and I can't count anymore, I can ask the Chazan to have me in mind while he's counting with a blessing, I'm saying. And I have to be included in the bracha, and I can't say the bracha, I missed my counting. But I can depend on the chazan, if he has me in mind. So we do find in many cases that one is responsible for the other. So assuming right now this is our answer, kol Yisrael HaRavim Zebazeh, that all of us are responsible for each other, then first of all we have to find some sources to back it up. The first source, source that our sages explain is in the book of Vaikra, chapter 26, verse 37. The verse says, Ish be'avon achiv. Each man will stumble over his brother. Saying in other words, that if you sin, I also get affected. That's how it works. And that's the fact. If you sin... As it says, each man will stumble over his brother. You sin, but I stumble. Because you sin, we're responsible for each other. So the Torah tells me, yeah, yeah. 
If chas v'shalom I sin, everybody suffers from that. And you know the famous story that was questioned, it's, it's uh, talked about it in, both in the Midrash and in the Zohar, and uh, the modern uh, version of the story is that a person goes on a cruise and uh, a ship full of people, and then they find one guy in the bottom, one of the cabins, drilling a hole in the wall, and they tell him, what are you doing? He's like, no, I want some fresh air. Fresh air? I mean, you make a hole in the ship, water will come in, the whole ship would sink. He says, mind your own business, it's my room. Yeah, but the whole, si the whole ship will sink. Same thing here. You sin, we all suffer. Very simple. Okay, that's not enough. There's another source in the book of Vaikra, chapter uh, 5, verse A. Venefesh ki Translation, if a person sins. Sages explain why it says nefesh, not nefashot. Because we all want nefesh. We all want soul. And through the last few classes that we're going through, both in Sharek Dusha and Sharek Gulim, we explain it. We all want soul. We all want a big entity. Now we're separated into sparks, but we want soul. So we're all responsible for each other. The Torah continues and gives another source, chapter, uh, book of Devarim, chapter 29, verse 9. Atem nitzavim ayom. You are all standing this day before God. What is it? Atem nitzavim? We're all standing together. We're all one big unity. We're not standing separately. Saying in other words, kulam arevim. We are guarantors to each other. If you succeed, then I succeed too. You fail, I fail. You sin, I suffer. That's how it works. That's how the system works. That's how Hashem created the world. The Torah continues, gives us another source in the book of Vaikra, chapter 19, verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your fellow, but you shall not bear sin on his account. Saying in other words, that if I don't rebuke you that you are about to sin, I have part of your sin. Now, of course, to rebuke it's not so simple. That's why the verse starts by first by you should not hate your brother in your heart. If I come to rebuke you, it's not because I hate you, it's because I want to help you. But if I see you sinning and I'm not coming and telling you anything about it, I carry the sin because I could have told you, don't do that. Now, you might be embarrassed, you might be shy, you might not want to start an argument, but it doesn't matter. You'll carry a responsibility of the sin. That's a big responsibility. An easiest way to explain this whole uh, guarantor business is when the car, you go with the car from point A to point B, really what takes the car from point A to point B, then... Uh, one might say the wheels, no wheels, the car doesn't go anywhere. The gas, the engine, I mean, one can argue and say without the gas, if I could push the car, the wheels will still turn. So just to make it a simple analogy, the wheels are the most important things. They take the car from point A to point B, but the steering wheel still gets to the same destination and the seats and the doors and the windows, everything comes. Why? Because they're all included one or the other. You don't separate the car to 500 pieces and you ship them with UPS. The whole car goes from point A to point B. How come the steering wheel arrives? Because it's included in the car. Same thing here. We all one big entity. You are responsible for this. You are responsible for that. We all assist each other. We're all responsible for each other. We all guarantors to each other and we all carry the same weight. Therefore, you are responsible. If you are a, a Kohen, a priest, that's your mitzvot. You are a, a, a king, that's your mitzvot. Now, of course, comes another question. Okay, so now we don't, let's say we have priests right now. The priests don't really do their work because we don't have Beta Mikdash. So what? For thousands of years, we didn't have Beta Mikdash. So wh wh what are we doing here? How am I going to do that? Okay, let's say we share responsibility. In our generation, but we still don't have better Mikdash. So the explanation is that, first of all, that if I connect myself to another person, let's say just for the sake of the example, I connect myself to the Kohen, which he has a lot of responsibility and a lot of mitzvot, then I, and I connect myself to him in a complete connection, then I will merit his mitzvot. 
Now, how will I connect? Okay, at the time of the Bet HaMikdash, so I would have a field, then I would give my 10% to the Kohen and to the Levi, so I connect with them, I support them. Needless to say that I have to also connect with them as a friend, as a brother, as a neighbor, not to have hate towards them and so forth. Saying in other words that each and every one of us, kol echad mitzad atzmo hushum davar, every person, when you are an individual, you are a nothing. When you put everything together, then you have a significance. Saying in other words that if I hold myself as a separate entity, I'm, a, I'm really a nothing, I'm worthless. That in itself is a great lesson in humility. By saying, if I'm arrogant and I'm saying, I can figure it out, I'll do it myself, you, you are really a nothing. When are you a something? When everybody's working together. Then we're serving Hashem in a complete way. So if I say, I don't need to pray in a minyan, I don't need to help others, I will do it by myself. I would live in some island and do everything myself. Okay, you're not, doing, you're not serving Hashem the right way. Because you're not going to be able to do acts of kindness, you're not going to be able to do charity, you're not going to be able to host guests in your table, you might be praying very quietly, but you don't pray in a minyan, etc., etc. That's it. So first thing we need to take, that as an individual, I'm a nothing. Which in itself is a great, a great lesson, because we are arrogant, we have an ego, and the teachings of Rabbi Chavita says, Adam mitzad atzmo klum. And I have to internalize it that by myself, I'm really a worthless. When, I, when do I become with value is when I connect myself to the community, to the club, and then we're serving Hashem in a perfect, perfect way. Now, now we have another way. Now we were talking about the option of connecting to another individual. Another thing is, another approach is that I have to... Uh, Connect myself by prayer to the actions of my fathers. Okay? The simple explanation, I can inherit now a building. It's not my building. I got it as a Yerusha, as an inheritance. Same thing here. Our forefathers did certain acts. If I connect myself to their acts, then I, so to say, inherit their actions. How would I do that? That has to be done through prayer and speaking. Where do we see that? That before we pray Shacharit and Micha, we say Korbanot. We say, we read certain texts of the offerings and the sacrifices that were done in Bet HaMikdash. And why do I do that? Because I don't have Bet HaMikdash. And our sages said, Uneshalma parim sefatenu, instead of bringing bulls, I will say it with my mouth. And yeah, our sages explain very simple. You did it with your mouth, it's like as if you did the mitzvah. So we don't have now a Bet HaMikdash. I can be in unity, we can all be in great unity and oneness, but we don't have Bet HaMikdash. Okay, now let's depend on the, uh, the work of the hundreds of years that our fathers, ancestors did in Bet HaMikdash. And we connect ourselves to their actions. And this is another way and another approach. Now comes another question. If this is the case, what I presented before, if I can do something in a spiritual way, because, yeah, because you can do mitzvot with what's called spiritual meditations, in, with kavanot. And that's why I said before, if I can do everything in a spiritual way, then why do I need to do the actual fact? And not only that, if my forefathers worked and served in Bet HaMikdash, and I attached them, myself to them, so I will merit part of it, so I can do that with everything. Technically, no. I'll just sit and be like, yeah, my ancestors served the Shem in Bet HaMikdash. <laughs> I'm doing great. So the rule says is that if you have the physical object, you have to use it. If you don't have the physical object, or you don't have the ability to do it, then you can depend on the fact that you will have to connect yourself to your ancestors, that they did it. But if you have the physical object, then you have to use it. Physical object will be the tefillin or the matzah or whatever other object we use. And if I don't have, then I can use the spiritual part, what's called the nekudah primit, the, the, the essential part of it, and connect to it. 
And in general, yeah, one might say we're all one big entity, so everything that they did in Bet HaMikdash, I'm included in it. But it means that first of all, they have to be included in the klal, in the majority. If I exclude myself, then you're not connected. If I jump in and I include myself in klal Israel, then I'm included in all the mitzvot. Now, now we'll take a little break to explain how do I practically do it. So for that, we have to explain something very simple. When we receive the Torah, I'm sure you know the Midrash that says that Hashem went to all the nations and told them, do you want the Torah? And of course, all the nations didn't want to hear, and they said, no, we're not interested in your Torah. On that, of course, is the famous joke that the master of the universe came to a certain nation and told them, do you want the Torah? Do you want the Ten Commandments? They told him, what does it say there? It says, you should not kill. Ah, killing, <laughs> no, that's not for us. We need to kill. Okay, he came to a different uh, nation. Do you want the Torah? Do you want the Ten Commandments? What does it say there? You should not commit adultery. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we need to commit adultery. And eventually he came to the Jews after the older nations uh, didn't want to get the Torah. So he came to the nation of Israel. Do you want the Ten Commandments? He said, Ten Commandments? Yeah, I have tablets for you. So the Jews told him, how much does it cost? It's free. Okay, so we'll take two. So and that's, of course, the joke on the Midrash. But the Midrash says that the na- Hashem came to all the nations and says, do you want the Torah? Do you want the Torah? And they all refused. When Hashem came to the nation of Israel, they didn't ask questions. What did they do? What did they say? The famous quote, Naseh Nishma. We will do, and then we would listen. Okay. Now, interestingly, uh, very soon we're going to read in Shavuot the the Ten Commandments in Parashat Yitro. In Parashat Yitro, when you're reading this verse, it doesn't say Naseh v'Nishma. It only says Naseh. Right? Look in Parashat Yitro. It's in the book of Shemot, chapter 19, verse 8. It only says, we shall do. Only the Naseh, without the Nishma. That's when we actually got the Torah. There's no Naseh and Ishma there. Only Naseh, we will only do. Go to the next parasha after that, Parashat Mishpatim, when everything was explained more in depth, then already it says Naseh and Ishma. That can be found in the book of Shemot, chapter 24, verse uh, 7. So in the beginning, they didn't say Naseh and Ishma. Why are you so making bells and whistles? Naseh and Ishma, we will do, and then we will, then we will ask, so, when we started learning Sharei Kedusha, we explained that the 613 mitzvot correspond to the limbs and the tendons in our body, right? 20, 248, sorry, 248 positive mitzvot corresponding to 248 limbs or organs in the body, 365 precepts mitzvot lotase corresponding to the tendons of the body. There's one opinion that says that the 248 correspond to the 248 bones in the body and the 365 to the ligaments or tendons, uh, to the ligaments in the body. I mean, it's irrelevant. But we learned in Sharek Kedusha that the mitzvot correspond to my spiritual organs and limbs in the body. So when I do a mitzvah, forget about the commandment, the physical act. When I do a mitzvah, the mitzvah comes from the word in Hebrew, tzavta. Tzavta means a connection. Ah, yeah, mitzvah you can translate also as a commandment. But the word, the root of it, tzavta, means a connection. What happens when I do a mitzvah? Doesn't matter right now if I eat matzah, I put filin on, I wrap myself with tilit. It doesn't matter. Whatever mitzvah that I do, I pull down a godly light into the world. That's, I, I was about to say physically, but that's what physically happens. That's spiritually what happens. And every mitzvah will pull a different light into the world. Now, where would that light dwell on an effect? On one of the organs and limbs in my body. Now, we don't know which mitzvah does on which uh, organ. I know many people want to know that because then you would know, oh, if I have some type of a sickness in a certain limb, maybe it's a mitzvah that I'm not doing. So we know on some of them. But the fact is that when I do a mitzvah, I pull down to the world a godly light. 
If I would have some type of a way of vision of looking at it, it will dwell on a certain organ or limb in the body and will give it its vitality and its chayut and its life force. Okay. And needless to say, when I don't do it, then the godly light doesn't shine on the organ. And we learned that thoroughly in, in the first few gates in Shar, Sharek Yadusha, how the mitzvot are connected to the limbs and the organs in our body and how it's affecting it in many different ways. Now, if this is the case, like I told you, we can never do all 613 mitzvot. So what am, I am bound to be spiritually crippled. I mean, we're going what the book is telling us. If I have to do all 613 mitzvot, and if I'm not doing one mitzvah, then the limb or the tendon or the, or the bone or the, or the organ doesn't get its godly light dwelling on it. So that limb now, or the organ, is missing the godly light. I'm calling it crippled, but the organ now doesn't have the godly light enlivening it and giving it its vitality. But I'm doomed. I, I can't do all 613 mitzvot. Why are you telling me, Rabbi Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Vital, that I have to do all 630 mitzvot, when in fact I can't really do that? It's impossible. So, the thing is that Hashem created a system that one might ask, how can Hashem create a system that is impossible to actually follow? Right? So there's two, question, two answers to this uh, question. One way of fulfilling all the 613 mitzvot is dependent on learning Torah. It's called Talmud Torah. If I learned about a certain mitzvah, it's like as if I did it. Okay. Pretty simple. It's not simple because now you have to learn the entire Torah. How many people are able to do that? But nevertheless, one answer to this question, Talmud Torah. Talmud Torah can make a gram. Learn the entire Torah. If you learn about a certain mitzvah that you can do, it's like as if, and you learn it, not like uh, reading. You learn about it, then it's like as if you did that mitzvah. Wow. The Chafetz Chaim once said, that the learning of the Torah is the only way that the light of the mitzvah can penetrate into the body. Saying in other words, you can't do it physically. I can do a certain amount of mitzvot physically, but if I want this godly light to come and, and, and penetrate into this organ or the limb, can only be done through limut Torah, by learning the Torah. And the mitzvot that I can't do, because I'm not a Kohen, or I'm not uh, in, the, in the position of doing it, or we don't have a Bet HaMidash, only through learning Torah. And if I learn Torah about the certain mitzvah that I can't do, it's like as if I did it, and in the spiritual level, I will receive this godly light to enliven the organ or the limb and give it its vitality. Great! Start learning Torah! And we have many great sages that taught us that, yeah, one should learn all the laws in the book of, uh, of uh, Maimonides of Rambam. Why? Because it covers all the 630 mitzvot. And by learning them, then it's like as if you did it. And you want to perform Bet HaMikdash, you learn all the rules and the laws of Bet HaMikdash and all the sacrifices and the offerings and so forth. Okay. So when we want to connect it to what I told you before with the whole concept of Naseh Nishma, why is the Torah giving me the hint that in Parashat Yitro we only said Naseh and in Parashat Mishpatim Naseh Nishma? So it says the mitzvot that I can do, then I will receive the godly light with action. I can put fill in on, then you have to put fill in on, and I will receive this godly light that will affect me spiritually, physically, emotionally, and so forth, then I have to do it in action. No question here. The mitzvot that I cannot do, because I'm not a Kohen, I don't have Beta Mikdash and many other mitzvot, how would I receive this godly light to benefit me? Only through learning Torah. Okay, now we conclude that option number one. Start learning Torah. The second answer is, and this is called in a very simple word, achdut, unity, unity and oneness. 
something that we unfortunately don't have much of, but we're working hard towards it. You can call it Avat Israel, you can call it Achdut, call it whatever you want. But the fact is that when I have true unity, all the gates are open. And again, this is far away from us, but we're going to read Parashat Yitro in two weeks, less than two weeks in, in Shavuot, when we're receiving the Torah. And it says something very simple. Vayichan shama'am leraglei ahar, mitachat ahar. Vayichan shama'am. Our, our, our commentary asks, Vayichan? Yichan means uh, sing, in single tense. You should say, Vayichanu. And they all part. No, it says, Vayichan, in single, keish echad belev echad. They were in such unity that they were like one person. And the unity allowed them to receive the Torah. If there wouldn't be unity, then they couldn't receive the Torah. So when we're talking about another way of receiving this godly light, I have to have unity and oneness. As an individual, I can only keep, perform, and guard part of the Torah. No individual in history were able to do the entire Torah by himself. Not Moshe Rabbeinu, not Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, not the Arizal, not the Baal Shem Dov, not all these great tzaddikim, even though one might say, yeah, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was able to do everything in a spiritual way, 13 years in the, in the, in the cave, but nevertheless he did it in a spiritual way, in a pneumute, not, not practically. The fact is that no man, including the greatest of all, if you're single, if you're yachid, you can't do the entire Torah. If shall ishmor the Torah, you can't do the entire Torah when you're just you. When I connect myself in real unity, in real oneness with everybody else, then I become one of a massive organization, a massive organism, and then I'm part of it. So I don't need to do everything because we're all doing it together. Like the analogy I told you with the car going from point A to point B. Yeah, you said the wheels, the engine, the fuel. They're all contributing. Can you say, oh, without the wheels, we will never make there. Without the fuel. No, we all, the whole system is one big organism. Same thing here. I don't need to be a Kohen. I need a Kohen to be a Kohen. I need to have unity with the Kohen. I cannot be separated from the Kohen with all sorts of disagreements, arguments, and so forth. So when the Torah comes and told me, Naseh v'nishma, if it's just the Naseh, when did we hear, when did we say Naseh? In Parashat Yitro, when we were in unity. Then I don't need the Nishma also. I just, did the, I just do the, the actual act. So he says, if chas v'shalom, there's sinat chinam, baseless hate, no unity, no oneness, I can only do the, the Torah with action. So I'm limited. I can only do what I can do. When there's no unity. Now when there's no unity, then what do I need? Naseh v'nishma. So I need to do it in action, but I also need to, the limud Torah. Because I don't have unity. Or the ability. But when we have unity and oneness, then I only, I only, I only need the maaseh. I don't need the nishma. Right now, since we, forget about now if we have unity or not. Right now we don't have Bet HaMikdash. Uh, that's another obstacle that we have. But to answer the question that we have, that we're presenting, how can I do all 613 mitzvot? If we get to a point that we are in complete unity, then we don't have a problem. We become one big organism, and I do what I do, you do what you do, and we all contribute together. But that's a very... Uh, uh, needless to say a great dream that's going to happen when Mashiach is going to be here because we're going to be in a state of unity a state of oneness and we're all going to contribute that's why you know a lot of people wonder why, how is it going to be when Mashiach is going to come we're going to have jobs we're going to, what are we going to do we're going to learn Torah all day long but how are we going to live then we're all going to barter one country is going to have tomatoes and cucumbers. It will give to a different country its tomatoes and cucumbers. And they will get rice and flour. And that's how it's supposed to be. It's everybody in conjunction. We all separate. We all uh, working in a way that we're helping each other. When the Jews came to the land of Israel 73, 74 years ago, they established what's called kibbutzim. It doesn't matter that it was established in the wrong way 
based on distorted visions, but the, the idea is the right idea, is to live in a kibbutz. You work in the, in the farm, you work the land, you in the chicken coops, you with the cows, you educate the kids. You, yeah. That's the approach of the Baal Sulam, who lived about a hundred years ago. There's a community here, all the news, a few kilometers from here. That's the idea, that they all work together. Every person has their job, their responsibility, their task, and they all work together, and they're all helping each other. Whether it's successful or not right now, we're still in Galut. It's not that successful. But that's the vision of the Baal Sulam, Rabbi, Rabbi Ashlag, who said that's how we're going to live at the time of Mashiach. You know how to teach, you're the educator. You know how to heal, you're the doctor. You know how to work the land, you're the farmer. Now I give you from what I have, you give me from what you have. I will teach your kids, you give me the food that you worked in the land. And we're all doing it loving and happy and supporting. And that's unity, that's oneness. Now we don't really have it for many different reasons. So what are we left with? Limut Torah. But really when the question is asked, how can we do 613 mitzvot? Then now here's your answer. If we can reach the level of unity, then great. Which I don't think is so easy. The thing is that you might not want to be in unity with me. Not you per se. I'm just saying, maybe that person doesn't like me. But it doesn't mean that I don't have to be with unity with them. If I exclude myself from the klal, from the majority, then I'm a nothing. I am a nothing and I have to internalize that without all of you, I'm a nothing. As the great... Uh, uh, drasha, there was a question, Hashem, why did you create the world? Hashem says, I wanted to be a king. Okay, so be a king. But how can I be a king with no nation? En melech beloam. Hashem says, I want to be a king. I have the desire of being a king. So I had to create a nation. Same thing here. If I want the unity, how can I have unity if I'm not willing to be part of a community or part of a klala, a, a majority? So first of all, I have to understand that I have to humble myself and to know that without you, I'm a nothing. I can be the greatest teacher, the greatest whatever, but I'm a nothing. I can be an amazing teacher. If nobody comes to the class, who am I going to talk to? To the wall, to the fish. I'll talk to the camera, but nevertheless, if I don't, if, if, if I have great wisdom to share and nobody wants to listen, I'm a, I'm a, my wisdom is worthless. So first of all, what we need to take from that is the practice that I need to humble myself and to understand that I have to become, become one of this massive organism. And the second way is to understand that everything can be done through learning Torah. Yes, it's not the fact, the actual ma'aseh, but right now I'm limited. I, did I choose not to have Bet HaMikdash? If it was up to me, I will go build it myself tomorrow. But I don't have Bet HaMikdash. So I can give offering, and I can support the Kohen and the Levi, and I can really work the land the right way, because it's, we know it's not, not the, it's the Rabbanan, not the right and ooh, no. It's not my choice. If it was up to me, now we're building Bet HaMikdash. We're leaving this class, and we're going to build Bet HaMikdash. But it's, it's opposed on me. So in the meantime, I can't do it B'maaseh, or I was not born to be a Kohen, so do it by learning. And there are many ways there, and that is suggested to every person. So go and learn now all the aspects of the Torah, and then you're concluding it. You're doing it. You're including it. Now, for now, till Mashiach is going to come, if we're focusing just on the teachings of Sharek Kedusha, and I'm taking from it that every action that I do, which I'm calling a mitzvah now an action, it affects my body, my limbs, my, my tendons, and if I don't do it, then what the organ doesn't re reach and receives this godly light, then do it in learning Torah. And if I can't do it in one way, then you do it by learning. I once heard, uh, the rabbi is not known, so it's irrelevant to say the name, but a great, great scholar. And one time I told him, I can, I'm traveling, I can't get to a mikveh. I go to the mikveh every day, I can't, no ocean, no nothing. I can't go to the mikveh. So he told me very, very simple, learn the laws in the Mishnah of Mikvot, but learn it good, and it's like you went to the Mikveh. Now, that's because I didn't have a Mikveh. Now I have here 50 Mikvehs around me, because I go to the Mikveh. You can drive 20 kilometers to the ocean, go to the ocean. But when you don't have, I don't have the way to do the mitzvah, then learn it. And it's not so much, it's only, what is it, I think five, six chapters in the Mishnah about Mikvot. 
about mikveh. So learn it. So don't learn it. But learn it with the commentary and all. Just read it like speed the reading. So whatever I miss or I can't do, and how many times there were, there were people in communities they didn't have a lulav, they didn't have an etrog, they didn't have a... Now we have an abundance, Baruch Hashem. But when you don't have the physical object, then you can uh, supplement it with learning Torah. So when Rabbi Chaim Vital comes and tells me that I have to do 613 mitzvot, go now to all the classes that we went through, or go to the text in the book, and make a list what you can do with an actual object or with the act, then you have to do that. You can't give any discounts to yourself. I have to pursue, how can I go through all the mitzvot? And if you remember when we went through all the mitzvot, we went through some of mitzvot that you wouldn't even think that you have to do. Why? I don't know. Because most people are either not educated, they don't know. You know that you need to eat kosher, observe Shabbat, uh, and so forth. Put fill in if you're a man. But there's certain mitzvot that are, are very easy for you to do. You just didn't know that you can do it. So then you have to educate yourself and go through the list and say, okay, that I have to physically do. But what I can do physically, then do it with Limut Torah. Therefore, the Rabbi Chaim Vital comes and says, I know you can't physically do it, but you can still perform all 613 mitzvot, either in thought, by learning and understanding and so forth. And of course, you can do it with reaching a level of unity. That is a little bit harder right now because we don't really have it. But when we're going to reach to the level of ultimate oneness and unity, then I don't need to be a Kohen. I don't need to be a king. I don't need to be uh, in the position of the mitzvah. We're all doing it together. Till we're going to have Mashiach, hopefully it's going to be a matter of a few minutes, then we learn Torah, and you learn that. Now here comes another thing that has nothing to do with, the, with the Sharei Kedusha. I'm just going to add that because the Rizal explains that, that we have to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. Now, since now we explain that we can't do everything in action and I'm dependent on you, but I still have to do it in thought and speech. My understanding from what the Rizal says that if in our generation we can do a lot of mitzvot physically, must be that we did that in a different incarnation when we were here at the time of the Beit HaMikdash or at the time of the, the desert, that we actually were able to do it. And in this generation, what is left for me to do is what I can, and the rest is left for me to do in thought and in speech. How would I perform the mitzvot in thought and speech is when you learn that. Thought is when you understand the concept, and speech, when you learn Torah, you have to talk out loud. So what is left for us to do right now is yeah, to sit, find the time, and learn a lot of Torah. Especially on the mitzvot that I can do. Now if I'm physically, I can put filin on, fine, I'm good. But I can't give a, a sacrifice now in Bet HaMikdash and learn the Korbanot. Learn all the concepts. I can't do A, B, and C. Physically, then go and learn it. By that, we can understand the, the approach of Rabbi Chaim Vital and many others but since we're focusing on Sharei Kedusha, how, am I, how I can do the 613 mitzvot. And regardless of that, I know it might seem like a great uh, difficulty, but we have to work hard and strive to reach to achdut, to unity. And even like I told you, even if the other side doesn't want to be in unity with me, for whatever reason, it doesn't mean I have to resent them, hate them, uh, and so forth. I have to still have the love, the patience, the understanding, even if they don't agree with my political thoughts, or they don't agree with how I think, uh, but I'm still obligated in loving them and, uh, and being patient. I don't have to love their actions, but I have to love their neshama. When the Torah says, tuchech, tuchech et amitecha, I don't have to like it when you sin. I don't have to like your actions, but I'm obligated in li loving your neshama. Right now, the, body, the neshama is in exile. The body is sinning. Therefore, I have to prove, prove you, to rebuke you. But in the meantime, I have to do whatever I can besides the learning of the Torah, as much as I can to bring unity and oneness. Needless to say, that will hasten the coming of Mashiach. And when Mashiach is going to come, then we have Beit HaMikdash, we have the land of Israel, we have a king, we have everything. And then we can fulfill all the 613 mitzvot, Bishlemut, in completion, in a perfect way, and serve Hashem in the best way possible, how we originally were commanded to do it. <laughs>